MedCram. Welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about hypertension, and uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the definition, why talking about hypertension is important, and then the treatments. And I really want to dedicate this uh, first video to the treatments, the simple treatments of hypertension, and uh, how you choose medications to treat hypertension. So for number one, what's the definition of hypertension? Well, the JNC7 actually defines this for us. And the definition is simply any blood pressure that is greater than 140 over 90. Now, there's different stages. There's uh, stage one hypertension, and that would take you from 140 to 159. And then a diastolic would similarly be 90 to 99. So this would be stage one. Stage two hypertension, on the other hand, would be anything greater than or equal to 160 over anything greater than or equal to 100. This would be stage two hypertension. It's just a way of telling you what the different stages are. Obviously, the higher the stage, the worse the hypertension is. Now, why this is important is pretty obvious because we know that just from studies that high blood pressure leads to a whole bunch of things. Uh, you know, things like uh, stroke, things like uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, things like hypertensive heart disease, uh, coronary artery disease. And these things are all associated with very bad outcomes, obviously. And so if we can reduce blood pressure, we can reduce these things. And studies have shown that if you reduce blood pressure by even five millimeters of mercury, so if we just drop the blood pressure again by five millimeters of mercury, we can see a reduction in stroke by 34%. That's a third, that's pretty dramatic. Uh, ischemic heart disease can be reduced by 21%. Uh, and so that's uh, pr pretty good. Uh, you could also see a decrease in dementia, heart failure, mortality from cardiovascular disease, uh, and so forth. So these uh, reductions here are actually pretty, uh, pretty good. And it doesn't take much to drop your blood pressure by 5 millimeters of mercury. So I really haven't told you something that you haven't already known. What's the treatment? Let's talk about uh, the treatment. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about lifestyle changes. We gotta make sure that we include lifestyle. Anytime you have a blood pressure that's elevated, we have so much evidence now that lifestyle actually helps with blood pressure. We're talking about dietary changes, so diet, a low sodium diet is uh, instructive. Now we're talking about physical exercise. Uh, there's other things called biofeedback, relaxation, meditation. But again, I think dietary is key with low sodium. They talk about a DASH diet. You've heard of the DASH diet. So things that are rich in nuts, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. Okay, so vegetarian diet is very good for reducing uh, blood pressure. But of course the thing that we get tested on in addition to lifestyle is medications. And that's what I kind of want to dedicate the rest of the talk to because medications have side effects. Now, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and veggies don't have side effects. So this obviously is a very good thing to do, whereas medications are sometimes, you're forced to use medications and medications have side effects. And so this is the real philosophy when it comes to starting medications on patients with high blood pressure because really there are so many 
different types of blood pressure medications out there. And you don't start blood pressure medications because you don't know whether or not it's going to reduce blood pressure because you know that these medications are going to reduce blood pressure. That's what they're designed to do. So what makes you decide which blood pressure medication to start? It's based on two things. Number one, what the underlying diagnosis is because certain blood pressure medications help in certain diagnoses. And number two, what are the comorbidities that your patient has because these medications have side effects and you want to make sure you get the right side effect profile. So that's what we're going to talk about next is these medications and their side effects and how to choose which one to have. So there are many different types of blood pressure medications. The way I want to divide this is in a way that's easy for you to remember, obviously. And so in this first video, we're going to talk about the four major types of blood pressure medications. And I like to call this the A, B, C, and D of blood pressure medications. So what does A stand for? Well, A stands for ACE inhibitors and ARBs. B stands for beta blockers. C stands for calcium channel blockers. And D stands for diuretics. Now, I know that there's other types of medications, for instance, like alpha blockers, nitrates, vasodilators, uh, alpha-2 agonists. We're going to talk about that in the next video. But let's first talk about these major types of medications. Okay, so ACE inhibitors. Let's talk about the diagnoses that make ACE inhibitors useful. So we like to use ACE inhibitors in patients with blood pressure elevation who are what? Well, we know that in diabetes, this can help with kidney problems and it protects the kidneys. We also know that in congestive heart failure, it can improve ejection fraction. So that's important to know. We know that uh, it helps in post-MI, it improves survival. It also improves survival in CHF. So make sure you know those things because if your patient happens to have diabetes or happens to have congestive heart failure or ho happens to be post uh, myocardial infarction. These are things that help. We also like to use ACE inhibitors in patients with connective tissue disease like scleroderma, okay? And that also protects the kidneys, okay? All right, so those are the diagnoses that I would concentrate on. What about beta blockers? So beta blockers, we like to use beta blockers in, again, patients with congestive heart failure. It, we know that it improves survival. We also like to use beta blockers in post-MI. Again, for the same reason, it improves survival. Beta blockers um, can also be used in young. And I would also put young here in terms of ACE inhibitors young people who have problems with blood pressure. So these, these typically work well in young people. Uh, I'd also put uh, white here as well, Caucasian, young white. We find that it seems to be more effective in that population. In terms of congestive heart failure, the ones that you should know are the two special types of beta blockers that should be used in congestive heart failure is carvedilol. and metoprolol. If that's what you're using it for, you need to use those two medications because those are the only two beta blockers that have been found to improve survival in the studies for CHF. For post-MI, you can use just about anything, but um, generally speaking, uh, carvedilol and metoprolol should be used in those situations as well. All right, what about calcium channel blockers? 
calcium channel blockers really haven't been shown to improve survival in any patients. And so we don't really use calcium channel blockers to improve survival. Um, and so they don't get much of an indication here. But you should know that in African American and in the elderly, they could be useful. And that goes the same for diuretics. Again, diuretics really haven't been shown to improve survival in any condition. And so um, I would recommend that you know that African Americans seem to actually respond well to them and also the elderly. Okay, so those are diagnoses where you'd want to use those medications in those particular patients. What about side effects? Let's talk about side effects. Okay, so we'll just put a line here and we'll go over the side effects. So you'd want to know the side effects of these to avoid these problems. So what are the side effects of ACE inhibitors and ARBs? The first thing I want to talk about is angioedema. So that's where the tongue swells, the neck swells. This could really be a problem. Uh, so you make sure you know that the patient knows that if this happens, they can go to the emergency room. And we see it both in ACE inhibitors and ARBs both. Uh, cough, we see in patients 30% of the time on the ACEs. And of course, if we see that, we switch them to an ARB because we usually don't see that as much. But some of the co more common side effects would be hyperkalemia, hyponatremia. Also, we see problems with the creatinine, especially in renal artery stenosis. So if you have bilateral renal artery stenosis, that's contraindicated. You shouldn't use it in those situations. Obviously, you can have increases in creatinine, and that can cause renal failure, which is kind of paradoxical because these are medications that are used, especially in problems with the kidneys, to protect from proteinuria, especially in diabetes. So be aware that you know what those side effects are for the ACE inhibitors. Okay, what about side effects for beta blockers? Now, of course, you know that beta blockers can cause the heart rate to go down. That's almost not even a side effect. That's almost a known response. Obviously, they're going to drop blood pressure as well. But some of the other things you may not know is that it could increase your lipids and cholesterol. Uh, it can increase depression. If they've got asthma, it can increase asthma and COPD with bronchospasm. Uh, so depression, hyperlipidemia, decreased heart rate, increased asthma, bronchospasm. These are all side effects of beta blockers. It could also increase potassium as well. So that's something to keep in mind especially if someone has a hyperkalemia to begin with. Beta blockers can, can do that. Calcium channel blockers, you really should divide these up into two different categories. There are the dihydropyridines and there are the non-dihydropyridines. Okay, so what are the dihydropyridines? Um, let's switch to a different color to highlight what, I, what it is that I'm talking about. So the dihydropyridines are anything that ends in a, a peen like nephetapine, nephetapine, amlodipine, and also philodipine. So nephetapine, amlodipine, and philodipine, these are all dihydropyridines. What's the reason why you should know about this? It's because they cause peripheral vasodilation. Whereas the non-dihydropyridines, for instance, diltiazem and verapamil cause reduction in inotrope. What does that mean? That means it reduces contractility of the heart. As a result, we typically see the heart rate go down in this non-dihydropyridines, and we see the heart rate go up 
or stay the same in the dihydropyridines. Now there is a, uh, an exception to that and that is amlodipine. That's kind of like the black sheep of the family. Amlodipine tends to make the heart rate go down, which is, which is good because this is very good in ischemic heart disease. So if you want to use a dihydropyridine and don't want to cause the heart rate to go fast, you can actually use a uh, amlodipine, which is still a dihydropyridine, but it doesn't make the heart rate go as fast. So that's a favorite one to use in ischemic uh, heart disease. So what are the other side effects that you could see from these uh, calcium channel blockers? Well, you could see edema in the lower extremities. You could also see um, constipation. And you could see heart failure. Why? Again, because of this negative ionotrope, negative contractility. This is a, a really good medicine to use in uh, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response, these non-dihydropyridines, because they reduce the uh, response through the AV node and uh, aren't going to transmit the electrical conduction of atrial fibrillation, um, which is going so rapidly that the ventricle can't keep up and it will block that transmission. All right, so those are calcium channel blockers. What about diuretics? Well, diuretics is such a broad term. I think what we ought to do is break it down into the two major diuretics, and those are the thiazides. So I'll just abbreviate that as hydrochlorothiazide and, of course, Lasix. Now, of course, the, the differences between these two uh, can be major. There are a number of side effects of hydrochlorothiazide. First of all, hydrochlorothiazide is an ascending limb diuretic, whereas Lasix or furosemide is a loop diuretic. Okay, so what there are four things that you should know that hydrochlorothiazide increases. We know that diuretics, as a general rule, decrease potassium, so we'll put that on both sides. But what are four things that hydrochlorothiazide will increase? Number one, it will increase calcium levels, whereas Lasix decreases calcium levels in the blood. The second thing that hydrochlorothiazide increases is uric acid, and so that can make gout worse. The next thing that it could increase is lipids. And then the last thing that hydrochlorothiazide can increase is glucose, which you have to sometimes worry about in diabetes. So the four things I'll ask you about is calcium, uric acid, uh, lipids, and glucose. Of course, hydrochlorothiazide reduces potassium, and because it's a diuretic, it can also increase your creatinine and put you into renal failure. It can also reduce your sodium concentration, and it's sometimes the cause for a hypotonic hyponatremia, which is hypovolemic. Uh, if you want more information on that, look at our MedCram lecture on hyponatremias. As a result, Lasix gets rid of calcium, gets rid of potassium. It could also cause hyponatremia and it can also increase the uh, creatinine and cause uh, renal failure. So these are the four basic food groups, if you will, of medicines that you can treat patients with hypertension. So let's just go over these a few uh, just in your mind here. If you had a patient with gout, you would not want to put them on hydrochlorothiazide because it could increase the uric acid level. If you had a patient with kidney stones, you would not want to put them on something that's going to put a lot of calcium into the urine like Lasix because it drops the serum calcium level by dumping calcium into the urine, whereas a thiazide diuretic would be ideal since it reduces the amount of calcium that is excreted into the urine and thereby increases the serum calcium concentration. Now, in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these other antihypertensive medications like alpha blockers, alpha-2 agonists, nitrates, etc. So please join me for that.